Hello everyone, welcome to my shop, I'm Robin and welcome back to the DIY surface plate lapping video series. This is part two. I'm going to carry on from where I left off on the previous video. We're going to be showing uh, using aluminum foil adhesive backed put onto surface plates to act as the abrasive surface and um, in general that can work but the heavier plates, my 135 pound plates um, it turns out they're just too heavy, period, to be a good lap. Uh, there's too much pressure on the charge on the plate, and it just tends to rip the charge out. So they're just a little bit too heavy. Uh, they, I did get the plate, uh, as you'll see, to a uh, acceptable level. But um, at the end of the video, I'm going to be showing you uh, my ideas on um, making a lap for final finishing. Um, where I put a thicker aluminum surface on a, on a lap on a much lighter uh, cast iron plate. And I think that's going to work real well. You also see that I decided that grooving was a good idea. <laughs> it turns out that uh, grooves help a lot to get the swarf, um, give a place, a place for the swarf to go. And um, you'll see some scraping of me scraping the 18 inch square plates, one of my ones that wasn't finished, scraping it to be a lap and uh, grooving it. So lots of interesting stuff here and uh, let's get to it. So I'm starting to think that now the long aspect ratio plate, that one that's 10 by 30, uh, I knew that wasn't necessarily the ideal proportions, um, but I thought it'd be good for roughing and it's, it's done well so far, but um, I just want to try another plate. Uh, this is just a, uh, another plate that I have that actually uses my welding table. Um, so I'm just going to stone that off and give that a try and see how that behaves. Give me a little more control of being able to focus on the areas I want without it being uh, too, too small. If you get too small relative to the whole surface you're on, then you're not getting any averaging effects of, of straightness. You can end up with more whoop de doo So you can picture if you did like a six inch diameter lap and tried to lap this plate, You'd, it'd be a mess. You would just be, you'd, you'd go berserk. You need the averaging effect of the longer surface to bridge highs and lows and to uh, smooth things out. So I'm gonna try this other plate, see what happens. Here I'm dusting on our, uh, our diamond powder. And uh, this aluminum should really, really suck this up like crazy. I have no idea if this is gonna work, but it's, not a big deal to give it a try and see what happens. So I'm looking for something that's going to hold a charge for quite a while and really rough well because the everything has kind of slowed down now now that I've got the the hole out it seems like things have come into come to a halt and uh, not like I'm not removing material but not nearly at the rate I'd like to so I'm gonna try charging this thing up and roll it in. Okay now I'm gonna try rolling this in See how this behaves on the aluminum. Get this where it's evenly distributed. And then I'll get the stool out and actually get up there on there where I can lean on it, get my body weight on it. So usually, like on the iron plate, if I did this here, I'd be able to sweep up a huge pile that wasn't actually connected you can see there's almost no diamond and I put probably double the amount so this is really charging extremely well and I think I'm actually going to go back and put a little bit more on and try to get this really charged because uh, this looks like this is this could be uh, could be really great okay we're gonna flip this over and see what happens here nothing to lose take a quick trip around the edge here so the things are falling out I get an even distribution of it around where I want to remove the material feels good Oh, real nice. 
it'll be interesting to see what the aluminum itself looks like. Hinging looks pretty good on the plate. Remember, you got to keep an eye on that to see what you're doing here. would have been choking and getting sticky by now and uh, this is just feeling very uniform I gotta be careful and not assume that this is removing material as slowly as before and end up going convex I know I'm pretty severely concave so I'm gonna take another another pass around let's let's take a look at the lap before we go too far and see what it looks like, what kind of condition we've got going on here. Here's a look at the at the plate. I think these parts are where it's puffy and the aluminum's actually floating up and down, but it's cutting beautiful. I mean, it feels really smooth and like we're really removing material and the charge is staying put. The iron plate seemed like one lap and I was losing the charge and I just started to rub iron on. Well, I don't know what I'm going to see when I measure here, but I'm really impressed. I'm, I'm like the cutting action difference between these two is like night and day. Really, really nice. Just consistent. And uh, yeah, it seems like this charge is actually staying put and just continuing to cut very, very nicely. Get in here and see how how close this can uh, see. Yeah, that is really, really doing a nice job. So I'm going to take this off, clean this off, and do a, a check with the level and see where we are. So I want to point out some some details here that can bite you. Uh, I'm using the lap with the aluminum uh, sheet foil bonded to it which is working nicely as a lap. I've taken multiple passes around here and got tired of these corners still be staying high and not really getting knocked down. So I really focused on these corners getting the center of gravity of the plate you know pretty far out here and, and working in a circular arc here assuming that this thing's roughly spherical concave and it worked in this zone all right. Uh, now the 11 inch spacing that I'm using on the um, on the uh, level that you see here that's working wonderful as far as general contour and seeing what's going on in general but you got to be you have to remember that when you do that there are things that can happen within this spacing that you're not aware of and I just want to show you one of those things so focusing on this the plate now, if I measure at these points, is down to about three tenths overall bow on all all the perimeter. Just going on the per perimeter, doing each edge on there. Uh, we're only talking about three tenths. But if you look at this, this is zeroed. This is basically acting as a repeat meter. It's got two feet, well three feet, and then this is three and a half spacing. So this is three and a half inches out further, uh, silicon nitride ball. So right here, this is running long. Okay, it's generally zero. All right. Now watch what happens when I get here to where the zone where I'm measuring here. That's dropped two tenths right there, and that's because of me getting the center of gravity of the plate over here. I'm starting to roll this off where uh, I'm because I'm working with a small 
surface area that isn't bridging a lot of things, I'm getting to a point where I'm, I'm getting in trouble. And if you didn't come back and check with this finer resolution, meaning something in between here to see what these undulations are, you wouldn't see this little drop off because I'm only measuring from here to here and then the, from here to here and I'm only looking at the general topography and missing the fact that I'm digging a hole here. I'm okay. This is, this is going to come out. All it means is that since this is technically three tenths high right here, by the time I lap this down, the rest of this down to where it meets this, it's going to be fine but it points out that you need to do other checking and look for this type of thing and it, it, it's the same thing in the other direction I'll get my roughly zero and then it drops off it's not quite as, as drastic in the uh, short axis the three foot axis of the plate I'm going to do a run through of the uh, inspection procedure that I'm using on this I have my drywall square blade marked out with uh, markings on it for the 36 inch direction. I have markers at each end where I line the plate edge up, so it's 36 inch plate edge. Then I have the foot locations at the 5.5 spacing that works out for the Renzimeter. And then this has the 11 inch foot spacing so that for quick overall assessment I can, I can do that. So first I put this centered because on this one there's only going to be three places here and then the foot location here and here. This is my counterbalance we discussed before to offset the influence of the plate and the lap is still sitting on there because I'm using the lap to tweak my position and right now actually the lap is is just about in the right spot so simply by moving the lap weight back and forth here over uh, laterally to change the weighting of the plate, I can tweak my reading so I get my bubble perfectly centered. Again, right now we're just roughing. So I'm zero here, my bubble's perfectly centered. Now I'm going to move over to where this foot goes where the last one was. That's the principle that we're using here. That's what the way all of the measuring systems, doesn't matter whether you're using an autocollimator, a laser, whatever, you're still using a two footed item to go from one reading and then from that to the next elevation, from there elevation, and then calculating what's going on. Now, I have to move this to the corresponding place opposite to balance the weights. These are the same weight, so now I'm centering it so that the plate's not tilting. Now I can come in and read this, and um, that's probably about only about a, barely a tenth from here to there rise. Now, in theory, if this is a perfect curve, there's if that's a tenth in that distance and this is a uniform curve, there's some here we're not seeing because we're bridging the curve here. This still, if it's a curve, it's still the, there's still the belly here. If you picture this being uh, concave, which it was more severely before we got to this point. So, uh, in general, though, we're only talking about a barely a tenth rise on that foot. So, if I come now, shift the directions to the other side bring this left foot over here to where this was, put this over here in its counterbalancing position, and read what we've got here. That'll tell us what's going on on this end. I, I was previously had about six tenths high here. This originally the pole plate when they, uh, the people who started on this and quit when they were roughing this, they roughed it pretty concave. This was almost a full thousandth high on the corners relative to the center. Uh, and I've got it down now. I, I really focused on the corners and got, finally got it down to where it started to behave. And now uh, this is basically zero. So in this direction, this is below uh, lab grade. Lab grade for this plate is, is uh, two tenths total band. So this right here, according to the level, and actually this is relatively accurate. Um, this is below lab grade already just in the roughing pass. So that's the procedure on the uh, four foot side. Do the exact same thing except I have markings for the four foot side that are different because there we have the foot in the center. We go here and here because we get four locations and do the same thing. Uh, 
I have checked that and that's barely a tenth, uh, maybe a tenth and a half on each end high in that direction. So we, we actually are at lab grade already, uh, below lab grade just from this relative to the, using the level as a reference. And actually, um, not that you'd want to certify a plate using this, but for, for in reality, for shop purposes, this is already way good. Remember, a B grade plate at this size is six tenths is the tolerance. So this thing was already a B grade plate before I even, when I got to my six tenths location after my thousandth, that was already in spec for B. So um, we're just going to keep going. And also the uh, 40 micron that I'm using on this to rough does not leave a surface finish that is really uh, ideal for uh, a real high precision plate. This will tend to, first of all, it's a little bit hard to clean. Um, it's not like it's horrible, and maybe a lot of plates probably are this finish as is, but um, I, I definitely want to get the finish a lot better. So I have the aluminum foil on the plate. I have the, uh, what is it, 1200 mesh, or which is roughly 10 to 16 micron diamond powder rolled into the plate. I sprinkled a layer of, a uh, very light layer and brushed it out of the diamond powder and then set the plate down on it and I'm taking a lap around there. I have no idea how this aluminum is going to hold up. Uh, I'm surprised that the weight of this plate isn't a huge issue here. It seems to be okay. This is a very heavy plate. It's like 130 pounds. Um, so I'm taking the lap around here in a minute. All this dark you see is the, um, I think the aluminum actually wearing from tumbling abrasion. And I, I'm just trying to get a feel for how this, whether this aluminum is charging or what's going on. I know from past experience that I don't want to get too much smut going on here or it will smear and tear. I just, I'm just feeling something right there. And that's what I was afraid of. See how it's pivoting around there? I'm going to yank this off of there and see what's going on. Um, this is the general problem with, with the aluminum. I thought that with the um, finer grit diamond that it being a much smaller percentage of the thickness of the aluminum foil that the aluminum foil would have enough oomph but obviously that's not necessarily the case. Okay, let's take a look at that. See what's going on. Come up here where we can tilt it without having to go all the way up. And here's the typical problem with the aluminum. You see what happened there where the adhesion just let loose and this just skidded and smeared the aluminum. This is very soft aluminum. This is 1100 series aluminum, zero temper. So right there, that is what frequently happens. Okay, now with the failure of the foil on the large lapping, uh, I think the foil is it obviously works fine on small lapping, but it's just not going to work for this with the dead soft aluminum. Uh, higher strength aluminum, uh, thicker, would probably work just fine, but even then for the final precision finishing I'm doing, I think the glue variations would be an issue. So here is the third plate of the three plates that I scraped. Uh, this is a much coarser more pattern, fine by most standards, but much coarser than the other two uh, that I did this is when I realized that, oh, duh, two plates and a repeat meter is all you need. <clears throat> you don't need three plates, so I quit on this one. So this one's not flat. It's not, you know, radically off, but it's not flat. Now, I charged this with some 6 micron one time to uh, lap some stuff, and, and I, that's when I remembered, oh, duh, this one's not flat. So what I'm going to do, the plan for making my finished surface plate lap is, I'm going to groove this because of the success of grooving the other one, just how much better that works uh, in doing the uh, uh, granite because of the place for the, for the swarf to collect and not, not make the plate rise up. And uh, then I'm going to scrape this using one of my other plates as a master. And I'm intentionally um, grooving this first to see how difficult it is to scrape when it's grooved. I think with the right techniques um, and the right kind of scraping, I think it won't be an issue, but we'll find out. 
But the first thing I'm going to do here is, since this was charged, uh, even though 6 microns is pretty small, um, it still will tend to uh, wear my groove tool and it will also tend to wear the scraper. So I'm taking an aluminum block, I'm going to put some WD-40 on here, and I'm going to try to pull some of the charge out of here by having it go into the aluminum block. Probably not going to do a whole lot, but it's, it's the thought that counts. So I'm misting with a little uh, WD-40 here, and we'll just see what, what happens. I don't know who's, who's grooving who, but, or who's abrading who, but it doesn't really matter. One thing I can tell is I got a lot of hydrodyn hydrodynamic float going on, so I'm probably going to go over to the bandsaw here momentarily and uh, groove the daylights out of this thing so that it doesn't float like that. So there's the groove block. Uh, just a, a word of warning, when you're working with abrasives you really have to think about what's happening, as in I said I was going to go over on the bandsaw and groove this. Well I just got done rubbing this on 6 micron diamond and uh, my whole intent was that the diamond would embed in this. So going over to the bandsaw blade and gently going in and putting these grooves in could seriously put a, a hamper on my brand new uh, $70 uh, starred bandsaw blade. So I went over and used a cheap hand hacksaw to put these grooves in. Should have grooved it first before it ever touched the plate, then I could have done it on the bandsaw, but you got to think about where your abrasives are charging and what they're going to do to your tools. So I've got my bar clamped on. Uh, it's inch and three quarters from the edge of the router base to the center line. I'm doing half inch spacing. Got the depth set with the single lip cutter I just ground. And this is 35,000 RPM. This is ultra fine grain, ultra micro grain carbide. And uh, here we go. That router had no idea that it wasn't cutting wood. That's how easy that cut. So I'm going to do the pattern all the way across. Obviously I'll have to flip and do it the opposite direction on the last little bit where I clamp the straight edge. And then I'll do it the cross direction. Very important that you have a uniform layer that doesn't have any uh, blobs or whatever because those blobs will turn into a, a bearing that is not really a bearing. Okay, letting her down to get her first rub.
see what we got. Here's what a uh, pretty nice bearing looks like and, and a nice rub. We've got a nice contrast between the orange background and the blue. Good identification of the high spots. And um, over here we can uh, we can see the same thing. But it dwindles out and it's not touching here at the center at all. So it is concave as we suspected. Using my old friend here a uh, inch and a quarter wide uh, Anderson style scraper uh, bought this when I first did the, these plates long ago and the inch and a quarter width is uh, important for what we're doing here uh, in bridging these uh, grooves a good sharp scraper blade should just bite your nail instantly when you press down and push it should stop like a brick wall if it skids at all, or if it does, it really should just stop you dead in your tracks because it, it grabs so quickly. If there's any any slide whatsoever, it's dull. Um, it really needs to be super sharp. And when you, f you feel this edge, it almost feels like a knife edge. When you slide across sideways, it's so crisp. And that's what gives you a nice, easy cutting action and, and not a lot of chatter. I'm using a very shallow angle here and just taking long, full strokes. Because of the uh, very large radius on there, I'm having no problem at all going over these uh, grooves from the, from the grooving of the lap. Now I'm going at the 90 degrees to the first cuts, and I'm just taking a pass. See how this super wide scraper takes very wide flat cut and keeps me out of trouble. Making sure these edges are good there. You always want to, you never want to take a, a pass in the same direction twice because you're inviting chatter. By crossing the long smooth edge of the scraper bridges the chatter from the other direction and uh, there's no good reason for having chatter in your scraping. Okay, so I have hit these corners. Remember, this is probably basically spherical. So the, we should see a circle here in the center where, we, where we're not touching. I've hit these two directions. And same here, two directions. It really doesn't matter which way you go as long as you're crossed. And obviously, the magic of not having an issue with these uh, squares is that I'm always going in this direction. So I'm always bridging something. If I try to do it this way, nightmare. Okay, you're just, it's just going to be on the verge of impossible. By going nine, or, uh, 45 degrees to the actual grooves, uh, no issue whatsoever with a nice wide scraper like this. This large, you know, inch and a quarter wide scraper, an inch would be enough. I just happen to have an inch and a quarter wide. I have an inch and a quarter and a three quarter. Uh, inch would be fine. You could probably get away with three quarter. The advantage of this, the wider scraper is, you can get a wide cut. You know, some of these cuts that I'm doing are almost like five eighths of an inch wide. Well, if that's on a three quarter scraper, it gives you very little margin of error for starting to come up and hit the edge. The, the extra width of this scraper allows me to get a almost three quarter wide cut when I get super shallow like this, which is what I'm trying to do. Uh, that, that really helps. I'm going to give this a, a good stoning with the coarse side of the precision ground flat stones. I'm using an uh, 8 inch pair here uh, because that helps bridge and sort of flatten in the process. So by using this vigorously, meaning I'm actually bearing down trying to, to remove things, I'm inherently knocking down peaks that would cause uh, just a point hit and I'm getting rid of those and what I'm doing there is I'm saving you know multiple passes of trying on here because the flat stone is so straight 
I can I can lean on this without fear of digging a hole or messing up the geometry. And I'm intentionally sort of lapping with the precision ground flat stone. I'm keeping a lot of a lot engaged. So as an example, this corner right here is hitting. If I didn't do this, if I didn't stone this good and hard with, with this stone, um, that point would probably keep a lot of other stuff from hitting. So I'm literally uh, knocking things down until they start to bear significantly. And that is going to save tons of passes of, of, uh, of checking with the plate. So that's one of the beauties of the stones. Um, I know people probably think, oh, this guy's just trying to sell stones. You ask the people that have made these themselves or have them, and they'll tell you, no, it, they are magic. So uh, it's not just sales pitch here. Uh, yeah, these really work good. So then after I've done that, now I'm just going to take a general sweep over here and make sure there's no dingleberries that are going to surprise me. Getting close now. Pretty good overall bearing. We're a little bit light up in here. We still got a few streaks in here from roughing that need to come out, but uh, we're drawing close. Here's a view of the master in the front here, hanging on the straps. And then the lap that I scraped with it, the grooved lap. And I've got this a little bit convex. And I did that on purpose because the plates tend to wear uh, concave because the center gets worked more from overhang. So um, this is all scraped. Oddly enough, scraping on that uh, groove pattern isn't that bad when you when you hit it at a 45 degree angle, you know, either direction, 45 this way or 45 this way. It just bridges right across the groove nicely. So that wasn't really a big issue. Um, it had about two tenths, uh, a little over two tenths concavity of this plate from its original condition. So it took a while to scrape all that off, um, but uh, it's in good shape now. So I'm going to move on to charging this. So I'm saying to myself, how can I get this thing to the the situation where the uh, diamond wants to fall down and, and puddle in the in the uh, grooves? What can I do about that? Well, dummy, turn the plate upside down, brush it on inverted, just sweep the brush uh, this way, which is what I did upside down, and this is allowing the uh, diamond to fall onto the face instead of falling down into the grooves. So now the excess comes to the top, back onto the brush, instead of just disappearing down into the uh, gullies. So it should be a more uniform, use, use less diamond uh, that goes to waste in the grooves. Uh, I'm not sure whether it actually falls out in process, if it's dry enough and loose enough to actually fall out while it's upside down on the plate and get used up. Uh, I'm not sure, but this this is definitely a better way to do it. I'm not sure I'm blocking the shot here, but this way all the all that loose stuff comes right back onto the brush and or onto the face so that the brush can pick it up again. And this is definitely the the uh, hot setup here. As you can see, that really left a nice matte uh, coating of diamond. That diamond is just 
I don't know what's holding it on there, but um, you breathe on it, it falls off. So you need to get this over to the plate. Um, if you brush it with a dry brush, it just brushes right off. So um, you've got to be careful with that and get it on the plate quickly. Get So I take a toothbrush here and scrub out the, the uh, granite swarf out of the, out of the uh, grooves here right into the trash can. I finally woke up and realized, duh, get the vacuum cleaner out and vacuum the plate off and, and the table. As has been mentioned before, a repeatometer cannot in itself measure the flatness of a plate. It can only measure, measure the repeat reading ability of the plate. And that means relative to this, these two feet, the plane formed by those, what's the rise and fall of this foot out here? And that's representing the equivalent of a surface gauge or some kind of measuring instrument base relative to where it's measuring. So as you drive around and measure that same measurement different places on the plate, you would get what that variation in reading. That would be the repeat reading, the same as what this uh, measures as you go around the plate. So they can't measure flatness. They can only measure uniformity of sphericity. So picture the plate being a sphere of very large radius, uh, a very good plate with uh, you can have excellent repeat reading and yet be very f out of flat so what if you had a super flat reference like something down in the two millionths of an inch over this 11 inch span uh, then you could zero it on that then this would be able to measure flatness well thanks to my friend Sam Wagner I have just that this is a 14 inch diameter optical flat. So I can take my repeatometer down here. I've very carefully cleaned the feet. And I'm going to come down and set very gently on this. And turn on my meter. And check this out, make sure I'm sitting, sitting well and zero this out. I'll show you that here momentarily. So we've got the plate down there and then we'll come back up here to the indicator and I'm on 10 millionths per division at the moment um, and I'm zeroing that and then seeing if my repeat reading if this stays uniform here as I change positions here Yes, that's repeating very nicely within 10 millionths there. So that's my zero. Now I can bring this up to the plate. Sit down very gently on here to not disturb anything. Okay. So there's my, there's my reading now. So I can cover up my Optical flat. Thanks again, Sam. That is a awesome, awesome tool that will get used a lot here. 
And as you see right here, as we're looking at this, um, I'm going to reverse the repeat meter here and see what we've got. So that's plus 20, plus 70, 60. to the end and it starts to drop off. So there's a little bit of shape in the plate, but we're within about 60, 70 millionths there, repeat reading, but that's nowhere near close enough to what we want, where we want to be. Here's the general setup. I have the profilometer, the traverse unit sitting there in the front with the diamond uh, stylus with the skid engaged with the plate, the actual reading units in the back. One of the tricky things on the plate is finding a spot where you've got homogeneous, relatively pore free uh, material that you don't have any inclusions or things that they, the granite plates have pores uh, especially the pink granite will have more pores than this very dense black granite so um, finding a place where you've got a good smooth traverse without holes is important so you're not getting erratic readings here's the unit traversing and then we'll take a look here at what we're seeing on our division we're on the 30 micro inch scale on top and you can see there that roughly we're in the roughly a 10 micro inch finish RA. So that's what I'm going to target for on the other plate uh, to get in that general range. Uh, because obviously to do a triple A plate, Starrett, uh, Herman, whatever you want to call it, plate company decided that they needed to go finer grit to get to that level. So that violates the federal spec of less than 16, going below 16 RA. Okay, I'm shooting for a 10 micro inch RA finish on the granite. This is 9 micron slurry that I used on a cast iron lap on a Standrich block here as a test to see what kind of surface finish I get. Um, it's a little high and my whole purpose here was I'm ordering some diamond powder and I need to know whether I need to get some 6 micron in the process. And it looks like the answer is obviously yes. So I went and lapped this with some six, mic six micron, and that's definitely uh, that's definitely doing the job there. We're down in the eight micro inch range there. So I'd rather be a little bit on the shiny side than the uh, coarse side. Plate should actually wear longer with the finer finish. So definitely need to get some six micron powder on the way. Here we are on the big plate with. Uh, being lapped with the 325 400 which is roughly 40 micron and now we take a look at the reading here and we're on the uh, 100 micro inch range and you can see we're roughly in the 60 uh, micro inch range so 60 ra so a uh, long way to go um, and we would expect to see this roughness so i just want to get a comparison so we've got our autocollimator readings from our software, demo software that we're using. And you can see the concave shape of the entire plate. And then we have this chart, which is a little confusing because the plate axis is actually this way, the way I've drawn in pencil, not the aspect ratio that you see of the printout. So that can really confuse you. But according to this and according to my two-footed twist gauge, these are my high corners and these are my low corners. So this is twisted like this and like that, high, high. So, um, excuse me, high, high, low, low. And uh, it's very important to make sure that you're making corrections in the right direction. I've seen uh, lapping people take a plate so far off from reading things wrong that they had to take the plate away and have it resurfaced at a factory. So. Um, really important to make sure you know what you're doing. Double check. I just, just double checked again with the two-footed twist gauge, which doesn't lie. And I had forgotten this orientation thing. So if I would have just followed this paper, I would have had it this way. And I would have had the twist. I would have been ag aggravating the twist that was there, making it worse. So that's a prime example of really, really, really be sure you know what you're doing. And even then you make mistakes, so be careful. So I have a formula in here that converts the rise of the repeat-a-meter foot 
into an angle relative to the other two feet in arc seconds and then it has to add it on top of that because the the um, autocollimator reference never moves where on the repeatometer its new reference is where it just was so there's a hidden cell here that is taking the calculation to turn it into arc seconds and then it's adding the previous one to the current arc seconds to the previous one but all the way across uh, it doesn't make much sense but that's that's why I can use the repeatometer values and put them in here because it's converting these two um, arc second values so here's our last map using the repeatometer zeroed on the optical flat and using the photocollimator software to print out now I've written these onto the plate just to get a visual of what's going on and I'll lap accordingly corners are high These corners are still, these opposite corners that are technically low relative to those are still high in overall concavity. I just need to focus more on the, uh, the two opposite corners there. I'm trying to stay away from the middle, but not overhang too much because if you roll the edge over and you'll be a real unhappy camper. So here I need to focus more because this is it's important not to let this uh, swarf build up too much on the plates because it will start even with the grooves it will tend to start to smear and carry on so really a good thing to just keep after it and um, even though I'm not roller charging the plate currently uh, it's got a pretty good charge on it and uh, this shouldn't be causing a whole lot of problem There's all the swarf building up in the in the clearance grooves. I personally really think the grooves are very effective. Data is now all entered and now I'm coming in and I'm going to go on the 3D graph and um, looking at that and this is looking pretty good. Real good closure 12 millionths and 9 millionths that's very very good maximum height is 106 micro inches so just about a tenth uh, well a little over a tenth actually 
So, um, looking pretty good. As you can see, that plate turned out pretty nice. It's uh, in that particular measurement, looks like it's a AAA plate. We all know that vertical temperature gradient changes and things can move that around a bit, but um, as measured, um, a AAA plate. My repeat reading is uh, about 25 millionths, which is not good enough for uh, AAA. AAA needs to be half of AA, which would be um, 17 millionths. And uh, the plate that I'm going to show you next is what I plan to use to do some final tweaking. And I'm also going to show you some of the uh, procedures I use to make the plate. Uh, and in the next video, uh, it will be me using that plate to do the final tweaking to get this thing to be much better repeat reading. I'd really like it to be uh, less than 10 millionths and um, also keep it within AAA specs as far as below a tenth of, of uh, flatness. And uh, so this, that's why I made this uh, other plate. It's the same plate that I was using with the aluminum strips glued on, the lighter plate, the 50 pound plate. Uh, with uh, aluminum bonded to it and uh, But that'll be in the next video that you actually see me using this here I'm just going to show you the construction of it. So let's go out and take a look uh, What this plate looks like there it is. That's the 50 pound plate. I was using previously, but with the aluminum bonded on and grooved and one of the things that's important here is I was concerned about the bimetallic strip effect of having high expansion aluminum bonded to the iron. So my thoughts were here, if I groove this, if I go clean through the aluminum, it breaks this up and the acrylic adhesive has uh, some uh, ductility to it uh, or some give and that means that in theory the shear forces that would occur between at the bond line between the two different coefficients of expansion will be absorbed a lot in the uh, glue film. All hypothetical and who knows how that will work. But uh, I, because this is so thin and that I've gone clean through the aluminum so it's not a continuous sheet, in theory these can grow closer to each other uh, or you know, grow away and that gap is there to allow that to occur at the bottom of the groove. So we'll see how that works. But um, Next you'll see some excerpts of the um, manufacturing of this just for curiosity. Like I said before, this will be used in the next video when I uh, actually use this to try to take this plate from where it is now, which is just, just squeaking into AAA and the repeat's not good enough to get it well within that and get hopefully down in the 10 millionths repeat reading on the plate. I'm making a precision groove trowel with seven thousandths deep teeth those little pips you see sticking up there are uh, about seven thousandths high and about fifteen thousandths wide. I'm using a three sixteenths end mill with the point two spacing on the Bridgeport dial. I'm using these parallels as stiffeners. That spring steel piece is sitting down on the vice bottom, so I'm just using my tallest parallels, held them up to the right height to support that spring steel, so it wasn't flapping in the breeze when I was machining it with that end mill. Why would I be making such a thing? To spread this Loctite 325 speed bonder over this 14 by 18 inch surface plate, the volume I have there is going to end up about 4,000 thick, so it's important to get it spread evenly. Because I'm going to be bonding this aluminum to the top. I have the aluminum plate deburred well. The edges have been filed both flat to get rid of any roll of the um, shear action uh, on both sides to make sure that there's no distortion. This side has been uh, scrubbed with a uh, sanding sponge and then degreased uh, with alcohol. I have a piece of uh, film on the AAA surface plate to uh, keep the goo or the glue ooze from coming out onto the plate. And the surface plate has been stoned. Uh, well with a coarse stone, lots of tumbling abrasion to get a good surface on there, degreased. And then this has a layer of Loctite uh, 325 speed bonder on there, acrylic structural adhesive. 
and I put that on with a trowel I made out of a piece of spring steel. Since you hold the, the um, trowel at roughly 45 degrees, you have to increase the depth of cut by the square root of 2 to get the film thickness that you're after. All this is approximate anyhow, but that film is on there right now. I know it's hard to see, but you can see the gleam on there. And that's somewhat self-leveling now, even after the, um, the trowel. So I'm going to give that some time to actually self-level before I put the plate on to minimize any trapped air. And then we'll flip it up over, upside down onto the plate. I also have to spray the 7075 uh, activator onto the aluminum and give it three to five minutes till it wets. It's actually kind of uh, unusual. It, it kind of gleams up and gets a greasy look. Um, both these, uh, the activator and the 325, are excellent for oily surfaces. Very, very tolerant of surfaces that aren't degreased well. It's not the case here, but with anything iron, um, iron has a tendency to hold things in its porosity. So uh, it's a good choice of glue. It's a good tough glue, and it's uh, resilient but still rigid and um, uh, that's it and we have touchdown flipped the plate over lowered it onto the aluminum on the big plate decided to come out here and use the crane with the spreader to be able to carefully lower it down onto the acrylic adhesive and uh, very very little exuded out so that film thickness and thick amount was was pretty close. I'll let this cure till midday tomorrow and then I'll take it off, trim the edges and see how flat it is and then we'll scrape it to get general overall bearing and groove it and then we're going to use natural diamond this time. Natural diamond is a sharper uh, spikier kind of particle than the man-made diamond so should charge better and cut a little bit coarser for the same micron size. I'm grooving the plate with a uh, D-bit cutter 45 degrees with a flat. I did a corner to corner line and I'm doing half inch spacing and I was marching way, way across just using this, a scale to or a rule to measure and space this to cross then I had to come over and do the other side and I realized duh if uh, I could do both sides at the same time I almost got ready to use my inch and three quarter bar that I was using, but that would have made the pitch of the ones cut on either side not be a multiple of this pitch, and I would have been very unhappy when they met up. But fortunately, I realized it before I got there. Inch and a half plus three and a half is even evenly divided by 0.5, which is my pitch, and it works. But this allows me to take a pass up here on this side and still clear the clamps and come over here and cut on this side at the same time. It really cuts the time in half. So there's the plate, very usable as is, but I want to get it further, and uh, we'll be doing that in the next video. It might be a while before that video shows up, as you guys well know, but uh, definitely intend on uh, taking this thing a little further. Uh, thanks for watching, and I hope you found something useful or interesting in this video, and I'll be back.